Morning, everyone, and welcome back to another Super Coach Insider podcast. My name is Swizz here on a Wednesday night, talking Super Coach, answering your questions, and here with two very special guests. I'll start off with the former winner, M Super Coach Mama. Thanks for coming on. How are you? Yeah, good. Good. Formerly known as Super Coach Mama, but yes. I just I thought Prince was really cool, so I just thought, no, I'm doing good. Thank you. Uh, all, always glad to have you part of the, um, especially the pre-season chat. I think I've done it for the last couple of years, dragging you on here and always love having you on. And also a very special guest. I always thought I was the uh, best podcaster out here in the east of Melbourne and um, found out the other day that I'm definitely not. Uh, the man, the myth, the legend behind the coaches panel, MJ, thank you so much for joining us. Mate, it's a pleasure. It was great to get to meet you the other night. The guys at the Herald Sun in Melbourne got a bunch of the Super Coach content creators. It was first chance to get a chance to meet you face to face. So, pleasure to be here. And then, you know, we're with Super Coach Royalty with them, aren't we? Like, there's not too many people that have won the game and she's done it. So, mate, it's a privilege to be on the episode with you. And Ed, well done. You've done something that not many people have done. So, got to listen up to some of the great pearls of wisdom you're about to drop our way, I think. No pressure, hey? No pressure. <laughs> No pressure, no pressure at, all. at all. No, um, I'm retired. <laughs> well, I know you you deal with a lot dealing with some of our um most privileged kids out there. So I think you do a wonderful job outside of the super coach world, but also in the super coach world. Uh I'll start off with you, Emma. How is your uh, team looking at, at this point of uh <laughs> at the season? Um, I was so settled. I fit Jackson into my team. Um, and I'm really happy. Um, there's, you know, that song, Baby Did a Bad, Bad Thing. I, I know he's not a bad pick, but I have avoided Heaney all season. And, like, he's he he is in my burn books. Like, he is in the burn book that is underneath the, all the burn books, covered in dust, in the attic, you know, in the burnt house. Like, you're getting the vibe he is, He's as he burnt is as you can burn. And I look, he hasn't made my team yet, but I'm considering putting him in. And I'm like, what are you doing? And I was just listening to, you know, your MJ's um, Q&A and I was just like, don't make major changes to your team last minute. And I'm like, are you reading my mind? <laughs> um, so I, yeah. I was saying off air to MJ. I was, I was yeah. saying off air that uh, we uh, that I had a way too much spare time today and completely burned up my team, which is never a great thing the day before. But at least it's the day before because I have done that on the day before. So get it over and done with because I've got time to reset. Um, mm. But hey, if, if it's good for a winner to do it, because I know talking to JP the other night, he's been doing the exact same thing. So maybe there's something in it. Yeah, I know, but we're not. That's where I'm going now. wrong. <laughs> No, no, the, the year that I won, I was the most, I was pretty calm and I really tried not to make really crazy changes and I was just, um, funnily enough, I was just like, stuff, stuff everyone, I'm just going to do a team for me and that was the team that that I won with. Um, and also it wasn't like a crazy team because I had this theory that pods, like pods can make advantage but, um, a little bit of the conversation, I, I think, you know, you're having in the coaches panel, but um, I actually have this theory that um, it's okay to have a bit of vanilla team and it's this the training that really, well, really helped me with my, with winning. Um, but also, like, if you choose a really obscure pod, like, that's in the 2%, do you think that you're better than 98% of, like, ma- I reckon, you know, you were talking about 30% is a really popular player and that's kind of the line that you really need to think about these players. But I would say reverse reverse that as well. I think if you've got a player that's around 7 to 9 to 10%, go for it. I reckon if you've got the research, that's something that like, so I started Walsh, 7% and Taranto, which anyway, 9%. But that, that's the line I feel um, because there's still a lot of competitive coaches who do still have those players as well. Just not everybody have those players. But once you go into the one or two percent, you know, if they <laughs> they do a Tom Stewart and pull out an 18 on you, like yeah. luckily he was quite owned anyway. Yeah. That was a good start of last year. I really hope that doesn't happen again. No, no we don't want to repeat that at all. And what about yeah. yourself, MJ? How's the uh, team coming along, mate? 
I'm feeling pretty disciplined at the moment. That's famous last words, is it, with it in Supercoach, where you're going, yeah, I'm good, I'm confident, I'm happy. All it's going to take to politely change that is it's going to be one change can really have this cascading impact into, well, now I've got the money to get that other guy and now I can do this and now I can do that. So trying to be as disciplined as I can, haven't made any adjustments over the past 48 hours. I feel like I know what my structure is, really happy with the players. And and like you mentioned them, sometimes when you just take that pressure off yourself and go, man, We've all spent way too many hours, if we are honest with ourselves, let alone our significant others, if we have one, about how much time we've looked at our phones and listened to content and watched things. So to me, I'm mean, I'm in that discipline phase. I know what I want. I haven't made any changes. All it really is is now the rookies coming through with them getting named. If they do or don't pop, I should be okay. But watch me panic on Saturday morning when my vice captain doesn't work out for me, hey? <laughs> oh, I love it. Um, and with, with you, Em, now that you've won it, do you feel like more at ease coming into it? Like you you feel like you can take a few more risks or, yeah, you know, you're still hungry to like, uh, you know, I can show and that I can back it up and try to win again. Like how has your philosophy kind of changed now that you are a winner? Yeah, it's, it's gone in flux, I think. I think I also um, wanted to prove that I could do it. And I'm going to be really honest. I think it's different for male players because I had a lot of people saying that I, you know, that my husband made my team. And um, so, like, so part of me was like, I'm, and luckily I had, I was pretty on, um, um, pretty active on Twitter. And I actually had, you know, some really lovely people who were, you know, knew me and just knew me as when I was M and then when I became Supercoach Mama because I had been do that profile for a couple of years before I actually won it. So that was an advantage that I was actually a female presence and not just out popped out of nowhere, but I still had those occasional comments. So I did want to be like, hey, like I'm just wasn't just completely out of the blue. Um, and then last year I made 600, I was 660th last year and I was pretty happy with that. Um, and this year I'm just, I'm just playing and, you know, I had, you know, I had Cameron in my forward line and, Guthrie when he was, you know, and Holmes. And then all of a sudden my team is getting more and more competitive. <laughs> I just can't help it. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I'm just playing it a bit different. I'm just doing, I'm just I'm having fun, um, but I'm not trying to, like, I want to enjoy it. I just don't want it to have, like, to, to be a pain. And when it yep. becomes a pain, I think I will just do the 15 minute trade and just have a couple of weeks off. And that's what I really, really want. Yeah. You're right. And it, because it probably has been a big couple of years, but you are an inspiration. I know my, my wife yeah. crapped, um, cops it quite a bit because it's like, Oh, is that just your second team? But no, she's as passionate and she always obviously um, looks up to you, obviously what you've done in the super coach world. So and I know there's a lot of other female players who are the same, you know, it's a good one for the, for representing the, um, the ladies out there because yeah, that, that it doesn't matter what, gender you are or what age you are you know you can all play super coach well i guess i think the the limit's like 12 years old but above that um <laughs> you know you you can go out there and have a crack and um yeah so it's really good that you did and i think you've added so much to our community which has been fantastic i'll just put one out there to those who are watching and thank you for those who are tuned in keep sending those questions in we will get to some of them soon uh, and then from your point of view mj uh, because we've talked about the fact that you guys start researching from December. How do you feel like, you know, the, because you you do a lot of research, A, with AFL Fantasy Supercoach and, and like myself, talk a lot about that. How, how much time do you actually just get to put that aside, not worrying about what you need to do planning for your podcast, actually sit back and just look at your team and, and be happy with that and not be too many influenced by, I guess, all the other questions you're getting from everyone else in the community. I think it's just discipline, to be honest. Like, I know that seems like a really simple thing, but it's um, the beauty of researching so much, like doing the 50 most relevant where we count down a player every day for the first 50 days of a brand new calendar year is we make that list is kind of locked away a week before Christmas and it's taken it from about 300 players that it filters down from mid-October all the way through once prices, positions, trades. Like it's 
it's craziness the amount of time it takes to really be happy with the list and it's subjective at the end of the day which can be a little bit of a cop out if you'd really like it to be but it's who I think are the relevant players not what I think is a community consensus although that certainly is a factor it's a, how we rank it and where I put certain players but to me it's just being disciplined and the beauty of looking at so many players in depth and with the 50 is you are trying to look at all the nuances of every single player and so you do discover players over time you go I actually really like this guy and I see why the community doesn't, but no, this is right for me. And so I'm going to do that. And so an example of that is a Luke Davies Uniac. Like I am super keen on LDU in, in 2024. He's been knocking on the door of that 115, 120 sort of premium territories. And had he not kept having these little, oh, hiccup, oh, hiccup, he's, he'd be there already. And so we talk about a play with baked in value and an ownership space that people are still scared because of that injury risk and injury history. I go, get it, won't talk anybody out of him. But for me, I, I go, I'm all in on that. Everything it points to me of I'm happy to take that element of risk profile on. So, yeah, for me, it's just a bit of discipline and then it's fine who I like, who's good to talk about, and then just pick them for me if I like them. Yeah, no, I love it. Couldn't say it any better, mate. Okay, I'll get into some of these questions because they are coming in thick and fast. Probably the most relevant because we've got team news with Carlton and Richmond tonight. And this one has popped up. What do we do about... R3 with Naismith now being out. Do we still choose uh, Naismith knowing that he's got that 93 in his cycle or do we go with a 102K or have been suggested a 123K forward um, ruck loophole? Uh, M? I've currently got Livingston in my team because um, I've got Jackson at the moment. Um, <laughs> and what you were talking about, MJ, is like if you move players, it's like, um, it's like Jenga playing a game of Jenga is like, oh, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I, I don't think Naismith, I mean, I think if something happens to Nank, if he has a long-term injury or, you know, a couple of weeks, then we can trade him in without more trades and that kind of thing. Wait until he's on the bubble, wait until he's got a really low break even and he's named and he's about to play solo ruck. That's what I reckon. Yep. Anything out of there, MJ? The only reason you'd move away from that is if a Reedy gets named on, yeah. on Thursday night from Fremantle. I, I'm not too sure that'll happen. I think his job security and scoring might not be strong enough, even if that were to happen. But I, I'm very much with them. Is open up that trading link and the DPP link, get that potential red dot blue dot activation that's going to create a you know the vice captaincy captaincy loophole as well. Let alone the flexibility between those two lines. Yeah, I like it. I have had this suggestion. Um, Hitsky sent this in and saying Barnett um, for him, and it's not the first person. I've had a couple of people from Western Australia um, been messaging me about this one, uh, which is quite interesting. So Harry Barnett, who's uh, uh, 123K um, ruck forward, was listed for there. There's, there is some thought that if West Coast get a couple of injuries, he could slot in uh, to the back line is what my – um, you know, what's been talked about over there from, from people who've messaged me, which I do appreciate. Um, so I don't know if Hetsky is, is that what he's also thinking or he's heard, but just something there for the community. I would prefer Livingston at the moment just because um, I like the fact that, um, uh, yeah, it's 102K. Um, but, yeah, just the, the fact that, yeah, people are talking about him. He's 203 centimetres. Um, I think he's from West Adelaide originally. So, yeah, it would be interesting to see if he was to get a go before, say, a Livingston if they were to cop injuries. And it's it's West Coast, so they're probably going to cop injuries. Uh, so, all right, we'll go on to this one. I'll start off with you here, MJ. So um, he's going to, hey, mate, help you. hope you guys are well. Quick one, Took, Nick Martin, Wines, Dawson, Liver, or Henry Husswait. Jeez, that's a lot one. Um I guess if you let, let's let, we'll just divide that up into a couple of bits. So I think we'll, we'll take the mid price option there first. Took Nick Martin or Wines? Um, are you running with any of these guys? And if I guess if you had to rank them, what would be your thoughts? Oh, it's a good question. Uh, if you want to know who's based on who I've got in my team, I've got Nick Martin and I don't have the other two. So that's where I would have them at the moment. But Wines has a phenomenal fixture through that front portion of the year. Like it is as good as you can get. The only reason you'd be a little bit apprehensive is 
to kind of rank him based on his history was to rank him based on an era that didn't have a Horn, Francis, a Butters, or a Rosie. So as much as he's in that midfield, he is competing with a, an absolute bull at the contest in Horn, Francis, a silky smooth R- Rosie, and just the human kamikaze wrecking ball in Butters. And so I think Wines is going to be a great pick. For me, the reason I like Martin is that halfback role is just so juicy. It is so super coach these days. They love to get the ball in his hands. He was scoring some really big ceiling tons in that half forward wing role, which can be a little bit of a dead space for us. So for me, I'm leaning to Martin over Wines. But if someone said Wines, because of the history, pedigree and fixture, I would say go because because he he's as good as any of those options in that price range we've got yeah and we've also had simon put this up um he's gone any risk in that the fact that now parish is out do you think if finn is named could he go to martin instead of um, zachy merritt if you want to let zach merritt run free <laughs> that's god cool. bless you my friend like that that's asking to lose and that's no shade on what nick martin is going to be but coaches don't want to lose and be beaten by something they know. And what you know is that Zach Merritt will cut you up um, in, in a million knives. And if he's their only real midfielder, like Hobbs is going to flow through there a little bit. We might see some Sardis get some opportunity as well. The way Hawthorne win this game is you stop Zach Merritt, not the rebound of Martin. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Em? Can I just say, um, like, I, I think I like Dawson Liber and, and Harry Huswait. I um, and I think Harry HH, you know, you could have some flexibility on their other rookies. My question would be because I have Martin as well. I love wine. Uh, not I don't have wines. Um, I just literally think that um, I really think. Uh, do you have other captain options? Like, do you have Bond? Do you have English? Do you have like who? Who are your VC? Who are your captain? And if you tell me, because I've seen, and I, I think you boys would have as well. I've seen so many varied teams between such, you know, Ghana rookie, and I've literally seen a team with Flanders as M1. So, like, a lot of, like, but (laughs) the mid-price, crazy. It'll win win week one, watch it. It will, it will. Tony, if you're watching, good luck. Um, (laughs) But, like, seriously, wow. So, but if that's your, you know, team, Damien, um, like just, I think I'm edging towards Dawson and Libba. I, I love Libba. I wish I could start him. I almost started him last year. I say almost started. He was only my team for one day, but um, yeah. he I, was in the squad. Em, it's fine. Oh, it counts. It counts. But I just haven't got Libba because I don't know. He's one year older. I know I'm a bit skeptical, and I, I want to see proof in the pudding because Magnet Man could do anything really. I mean, Libba should still have the role. I, I think in the preseason he did that, but. Um, I really do. And I have Dawson's been in and out of my team personally as well. So I know I'm a bit more of a safer player. So, yeah. Yeah. If I had to choose between the two options, it's Dawson, Liber, and Huss Wait. Um, currently, I've got Butters, but that's only because I was playing around. And um, But I've had most people know I've had Dawson all pre season. I've got a mate on my, my shoulder chirping in my ear nonstop saying, get change Dawson to Liber. Um, and it, I even played around with trying to get both in. So having that Dawson Liber Huss Wait. Uh, but I still do have Ollie Wines uh, in there. But then, again, I've got that little bit of cash to get Nick Martin back in. I feel like it's one or the other. But if you are choosing, yeah, I, I'm more on that Dawson Liber Husweight train. And only more because, yeah, as Em said, it gives you more captain options. They're going to be probably inside that top 10 um, where I don't know if Took and Wines will be. Nick Martin... Um, you're right, MJ. You know he's going to get half, you know, backline status for us. Uh, yeah, he's going to see tons of ball. I don't think Essendon in that crash hot this season. And Tuke's got the early buy, which, and I want to see more from the Suns. Uh, it's like I'm, I'm not huge on the Flanders pick just yet. Uh, like I've got no problem if everybody's got him in, but they're not going to get to towel up Richmond every week. Like I can sit there and bag him because they're my boys, and we were horrid for apart from a 20 minute stretch the other day. Uh, so I'm more looking at. Like Richmond are now in my fixture of oppositions, uh, and if I'm going, if they're playing the Tigers, uh, yeah, I, I kind of want ownership of those players because I think, yeah, we're going to just give up heaps of points on that. Um, and talking a bit about Tuke, I'll bring this one up for Matty. Uh, so he's gone. Matt Rowell, a trap or a genuine pop option after he got the uh, 20 clearances in a game the other day. Uh, yeah, 
I'm going to go MJ first on this because I've got a question for you next up, M. So what was that? 26 so, con- tested possessions, 20 clearances, like yeah. a personal career best or something crazy like that for Gr- him? Like a, I think a record clearances in a match. Just staggering. Yeah. So politely, as you said, Richmond were Auskick level for, for at least half of that game. That, that was the yeah. worst I've seen Richmond in a decade. And unfortunately, I think you're right, mate, that – the the glory of winning three flags is now coming with the pain of a few challenging seasons, and that's okay. I think anybody that has supported a team that hasn't had three premierships in a decade would happily take a couple of years of pain like this for what I think is going to come. That said, that is such a highly inflated element of what Rao did, and while it is very indicative of what he can be, which is high contested ball winner, lots of clearances, good usage of the ball, first touch to those outside runners, gets involved in the score involvements. The answer is yes, yes, yes to all those. Adelaide are one of the hardest teams to score against based off some 2023 data through that midfield. A Laird, a Berry, um, you could throw a Dawson. And just spoken about how good he is inside that moment. That midfield's very, very different to the Richmond one. So to me, the fact is, yes, you've got the accelerated price movement with his price already started. But personally for me, I just don't think he's going to be someone that's going to make as much money as I want to be able to be happy to either A, hold him up till the second block of buys. Uh, and I like other options a little bit cheaper that don't have any stall points in the middle portion through this first six weeks. So I wouldn't say he's a trap, um, but I definitely don't feel like that's a sustainable scoring element. Uh, and certainly the opponent was much nicer to him than he, they probably should have been. Yeah, a hundred percent. All right, and from Nick, this is squarely here for you at M. Uh, massive question: Does drive me nuts how Max Holmes is not even talked about? He has the Tom Stewart halfback role, cheap in price. Will get dual position and will be a top scorer at Geelong. Is that this is your wheelhouse here, M? You know Geelong probably better than any other podcaster well, I know. <laughs> now, obviously, I haven't been listening to Supercoach Insider last year. No. Who was? <laughs> on, that was me. Like, um, or me. Yeah. yeah, both of um, us were stroking home so much. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, Nick. Max Holmes, Max Holmes, Max Holmes, Max Holmes. Um, no, he, he, yeah, he's an absolute gun. I really loved him. Um, now, I cheap price, yeah. The thing is, is we'll get DPP. Now, Willie, <laughs> maybe. Um, I really like him. I just, I, I've already got Martin who I've got a little bit more, um, if Martin wasn't there, I think Holmes would would have that spot. I personally only have one mid price spot in my M5. I know other people structured differently, um, but I've only got one spot for him. I there is a little bit of Chris Scott factor, and I, I do think if Bevo didn't exist, Chris Scott would be called Magnet Man a little bit. <laughs> like, I and I know he's last minute Charlie, like or oh, sub sub not sub. Like he's very renowned for that. But literally, he does like playing with his positions and everything as well. Um, and if he does, if he likes something, like, and um, then he'll go for it. But it, you just don't know. No, and I keep saying I'm not a Chris Scott mind reader. Thank goodness um, that mind. Uh, but I'm not. Look, if you really like, if you have a gut feeling with Max Holmes and you really like him, like he's an absolute gun. He, he, you know, did he? He won the sprint last year, the grand final sprint, didn't he? Um, yeah. I think yeah. it's a contract year for him as well, which it is. players always is. seem to add 10 points to their uh, right. score for that. Um, it's very random, but no one knows. Um, my parents live to live next to Max Holmes, he lives next door. Um, and he how am I only finding this out now? <laughs> introduced, introduced, my, introduced, and my dad was like, Oh, you're gonna play for the seniors soon, and I'm just like, Oh my goodness, anyway. God. Um, are you married? I'm 20. He was 20 at the time. Anyway, my dad. Um, but I'll let you know. I'll be if he knows is uh, he's getting anyway. Hopefully you, that house doesn't You'll have to come back on the pod and bring him on. <laughs> yeah, I'll still get no I won't. Um no, pick him, pick him, Nick. If you like him, go for it. I I draft, I know draft my all, all drafts are done, aren't they? Um if any, yeah, but I I would definitely think him him as a draft. I'd 
I just haven't seen. He would be someone I would jump on um, if I really liked his role. Um, in, I know, you know, I, I know <laughs> not everybody has the uh, Herald Sum subscriptions and that, but I did write about this the other day saying I would rather pay 50K more for Holmes knowing he's got dual position than, mm. the, you know, just taking a chance on him at 440. But that's to say if you really love him, Nick, you know, jump on. But, uh, yeah, I feel like, you know, he's 50K short of Nick. Um, Nick Martin. So yeah, if he's he's putting up those numbers, I'm happy to still pay 490. It's still a discount on if he is putting up hundreds. Yeah. And can I just say, start a little bit more vanilla than you want to. Um, coaches panel talked about this. You're a, it's a trading game. It's a trading game. That's when you can make those leap aheads. So that's where you if you watch the footy and you have the eye test. Um, you know, I um I I picked up Aaron Hall um on with the year I won um I actually didn't realize I looked it up later that he was 2.7 percent owned when I picked him up um yeah there's only uh, one other person big name out there that got on him before you and that was the yeah uh, that was the, fan, the oh, I was gonna actually say Abdul I think was before everybody oh, Abdul, yeah. you had about it with a hundred person ownership and then I think Pistol and maybe yourself so uh yeah it, it was good but and you're right trading game 100 percent like uh, like uh, those fans that follow our podcast know Chris and I a couple of years ago were way back and then we j- traded uh, Grundy to Cameron before most of, most of the other community got hold of him and watched our rankings high, you know, you know, jump up. And then we also jumped on Himmelberg early that year and, and we know what happened there. So you're 100% right. Don't want to go 100. I, I think it's not 100% cookie cutter with everybody else, but, you know, if you probably can have – as you said before, a couple, maybe that seven to ten percent in there, but the rest, yeah. If you if you try to say a little bit more vanilla, um, and then yeah, trade your way to success. That's, that's what, what I want to think about. Saying. Yeah, and think about um, um, uh, Raul as well. Like he's got the buy round three. What? How much money is he going to make? Like if you if you love him, you know, trade him in or. Um, and I don't want to say it. I'm going to say it really quickly. Place what I'm doing. Um, but plays, uh, there's always one. Um, so yeah, uh, that's, that's what I really think. Just write them down, write the people you want. Um, and if you can't quite fit them in or you think they're too much of a pod, just keep an eye on them before they explode in price. Yeah. If they've got the role that you think they've got. All right. I should, I should, I should quickly share Dan's first comment and that is like, uh, the great uh, mama in the house. So, uh, but if we're going okay. to, and this, and this is, I can broad this question a little bit more, but he says he loves his team, had 80K um, left, so decided on going to Marshall, avoids another buy um, player. I know MJ and I were talking about before off air about the Ruck situation. I know we, uh, that got put to bed pretty quickly in our group chat with Chris because he's just so fixated on Gorn and really didn't let that chat get out of hand. But for me, I've been, I'm kind of off gone and trying to debate between having English or going Cherry and Jackson that route. Um, what about yourself, MJ? Because I know you're pretty hot on a particular ruck. Are you alluding to Tristan Cherry at this point? I am Is that where you're alluding to that, mate? <laughs> Yeah, it all depends what you want to do with this ruck line. Like the beauty is we last year, politely, was two options. For for the year, it was it was Marshall and English, and then Briggs made a surge kind of midway through the season if you wanted to find a creative way of generating some cash. The beauty of this year is there is seven or eight options you can roll through this ruck line and feel really valid in so for me if you're looking for the player that's got the greatest role security and the greatest pathway to generating the most amount of money for you if that's your objective then Tristan Cherry is the number one option to do that he won't be the best scoring ruck I don't expect him to be that and I'm not paying for him to be that but if cash generation is the number one priority then Tristan should be a number one priority if making and getting a little bit of fat on the bone with your selection and getting close enough to premium sk- scoring, well, then all of a sudden, Grundy and Gorn should be in the conversation for you, let alone a, a Briggs, who I, I thought was beaten in big chunks of that game against Darcy Cameron around the ground and still gave us a super coach ton. And, and I didn't think he was all that much chop. And then, as Em's mentioned, Luke Jackson's got this run of at least four weeks 
that could very easily turn into eight. We know Sean Darcy's injury history is not that great. Uh, and then you've got the Gorn and Marshall and, and English component. Lots of talk to say you can choose a lot of things. To me, all I would say to you, Dan, is don't just spend money because you've got it sitting on the sidelines. You don't just go, I've got it, so I'll get it. Have a look at your team with some fresh eyes and go, what can I do with that $80,000? Does that get me to use a player that's been mentioned uh, on this video? Can I get a Huss weight now up to a Sam Berry? Because as good as H has looked this preseason, he's no certain to be there in five, six weeks' time. Whereas a Sam Berry is a third year in this system, and we've even had Matthew Nix come out on SENSA today going, He's our fourth most important cog in this midfield. And so as good as H has been, and not talking anyone out of him, by the way, just saying, can you reapply that $80,000 elsewhere and not just go, I've got it, I'll use it. Activate it, because Gorn is a different approach to Marshall, as you've mentioned. You're copying a buy. Is Gorn someone you're wanting to trade out of when it comes to the first buy? Is he someone you think is comparable to Marshall and an English? Start to ask yourself those questions. And if based on those elements... That's the approach you're picking, Marshall. I have no problem with that. But if you could use that 80K better to either increase cash generation faster or maximize scoring or do both, to me, I'd be encouraging you to make sure you look at all the options. No, 100%, mate. And I know we talked about Sam Berry before, who's actually found his way into my team. So that's a little one before I release my um, latest team. Um, so yeah, just what the uh, Matty Nix has been saying on that. Um, yeah, currently I'm running English, but I'm sort of debating that. And that's come from uh, a couple of friends of the podcast, George over there at FTTV and uh, Joe from Center Bounce, who's my very good mate, Joe from Center Bounce. So they went into great detail about Gorn getting uh, treatment on his good leg or his good knee um, halfway through the, uh, I think it was late in the second quarter against the Swannies the other night. And we saw what happened in the second half. Now, that was also Sydney putting some attention in. Grundy, you know, played out of his skin. But Gorn was dominating that first half. And then for him to just completely go out of the game, uh, I am now worried there's a little bit more into that. Uh, and in saying that, I'll probably, now that I've put that out there, Gorn probably comes out and scores 150 this week and the competitive beast he is. But we do know he does, you know, can miss games. Um, and you know, you only have to look at his other league and see how much strapping's on there. So I think he's 32 now. It, it happens as we all get older. Um, so yeah, he, he at other points he's going to struggle. And the fact is, he does have an early buy too. So um, I don't mind the play of looking at other rucks. So um, I'm with MJ on that. Don't just spend the money for the sake of spending it. But if it helps your structure, I don't think there's been enough talk about the mid year buys. Usually we get so fascinated by that. And this year, because of these early buys, we're all fixated. So I've been trying to plan my team for both buys, um, which I hope puts me in good stead uh, with that. So if Marshall, if you've got no one, I think uh, the the Saints uh, share the same buy as English. So if you're not quite, if you're not going English and you're going Grundy and Marshall, well, you probably can go there as something a bit different. Uh, and and like Marshall's second half of the year, especially the final series, uh, yeah, he absolutely dominated. So yeah, if you if you think there's still some meat on the bone there. Um, for Marshall, and he might have to get another couple of points out, then I'm not going to, um, you know, twist your arm off it. Uh, em, what about you? What are you looking in that ruck line? Um, no, I, I agree. I, I'm all, I'm still very confused. Um, I've currently got, I've currently got Gorn and Grundy. I had Jackson in there just for a little smidge, but he's back in the forward line. Um, I've actually had Marshall in and out of my team as well. Um, He's not a very sexy pick. <laughs> he's just used to say, oh, Marshall. But then you start looking at scores and you think, oh, he's got really good potential to just fire. And he's, you know, he's he's younger than Gorn. Um, and, you know, um, how long has he been solo right, Marshall? Uh, like, I think this is the second year of it. I think last yeah. year was his yeah. first yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. Lots, yeah, lots for him to learn. Like, he's, he, can, he can get better and then there'll be a little bit of growth there. So... If you really like him, the only thing that I would I'd agree is look where you can spend that money. Look at your mid bench. Yes, Gorn's a, um, a, a buy player, but um, something that I've tried to do is put money in my bench to make sure more reliable, um, more reliable um, rookies, rookies for yeah. these buys. 
which makes sense. Uh, and that follows on, I think we had a question more, or we've actually had a few questions about Jackson, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to throw through these ones quick. But is it, uh, Ben's gone, is it feasible to start three forward premiums in Flanders, Jackson, and Heaney? Um, I've also had Ben ask the same question, and then Heskey's talking about uh, Jackson as well. So um, that probably leads on to that, that ruck chat, because I think if you are starting Cherry, I feel a lot more comfortable having Jackson there as just some backup. Not that I don't think Cherry's going to sort of miss and that, but um, yeah, I just kind of, for whatever reason, I feel a little bit safer that I've got the um, that the option there. And yeah, potentially like, because uh, Liv um, uh, who was at Livingston is playing so many late games, I guess you could potentially put Cherry as emergency and then always, you know, if he was to score bad, put Jackson um, in that spot um, because I think that there's a loophole option there for a couple of those weeks at least. Uh, so I just feel like that might be safer. Uh, but, yeah, what, what are our thoughts here on the three premium forwards? And it seems to be the premium forwards that everyone's talking about, Flanders, Jackson and Heaney. Um, what are your thoughts on them, MJ? Yeah, of course you can is the answer. The answer is yes. Can you do it? Um, of course you can do it. But it just impacts what you do everywhere else. And as you've mentioned, you're now moving away from Bontempelli, who is arguably not going to generate you any value, but that's not why you're going to Bontempelli. You're going to him because of the security of he's a 120 mid. He's basically done that, I think, now three years in a row. Hasn't had a season under 100 pretty much since his second season of Supercoach. So it's as bulletproof as we can get about a player, let alone his durability. For me, the missing piece is well, what, what are you dropping your N1 down to? Who, who is that? Are you going all the way from a Bont down to a Took Miller type? Because are you getting out of M talks beautifully earlier about these options that are vice captaincy and ga captaincy options? As much as we are looking for value in our teams, we don't have the gifts of value captaincy and vice captaincy picks that we had last year. There's no Dunkley, there's no Cornelio, there's no Goulden, there's none of these forwards and we don't have the value of English and Marshall and Dacos that we did. So to me, you absolutely can. Personally, I wouldn't run that three. That feels like the line we've got our best fieldable rookies to me, outside of the midfield is our forward line. And by pushing them not just to the bench, um, that's fine. You're building up your bench depth and bench quality to generate your cash. Great, great, great. But are you weakening your scoring opportunities in other lines along the way? Not just by what you're sacrificing at M1, but, but Nick Martin at M2 means you've really got one option that you could put a VC or C option at, in that midfield. And then you're just chocking value through that midfield as, as much as we've got a lot there. Personally, for me, I think two is your limit um, of those options and both of them, you can kind of flick them away. Personally, I'd probably put Flanders. This sounds bad, but I've been cold on Flanders all preseason. If you've checked in on the coaches panel for me, he's always been a post-buy approach player. And as good as he was, what was it, 124 this week against the Tigers? Politely, if you can't get a 140 in that match you're probably not going to get a 140. So he doesn't have the hurt factor to me with the early buy. He's really got one price movement. He's the guy I'd be taking on, whereas Jackson and Heaney, I, I feel like if you're going to go any of them, those would be the two, and, and I'd fade my interest in Flanders. So it's feasible, but I wouldn't encourage it to do that approach, Ben. Yep. Em? I've actually, so I've just seen a lot of people talk about actually starting Heaney and then moving to Flanders if Flanders has got the role after the buy. Yep. Um, and if Haney's drops, but goes back to the forward because of the Sydney's um, really good um, fixture, apart from Collingwood. But who knows? They lost last yeah. week. <laughs> uh, I think that I put that in our group chat today because um, it's very much so. Heaney starts off with uh, it's a fortunate surprise this week, but the Giants midfielders did do you know pretty well against the, the Pies midfield the other day. Then they play the Bombers, Tigers, and Eagles. Um, as he's and it looks like he's going to play midfield for that period of time. Um, and then so you've got Flanders, who's the Crows at home, as MJ said before, tough midfield to come up with. Dogs at Ballarat, I think that is, I, I actually don't mind going to the footy there. It really takes you back to watching footy in the 90s. 
but it is nothing worse, especially if you're playing kind of half forward flank and then pushing in. It's the worst place to play footy. Um, so, and then they've got the bye, uh, and then the uh, the Giants. So it's not the easiest start there for the Suns. But then after that, they play the Hawks, the Eagles in seven. They've got North up. Melbourne in round nine. So it actually flows really well if you're looking at going Heaney into Flanders. And at worst, if Flanders has a couple of games, he's probably going up the same amount of money as Heaney anyway. So you're you're probably not losing anything. Um, and I probably think Heaney just with that fixture is probably going to average slightly more. Yeah, I mean it's one strategy. I I don't know. I'm I was a bit more conservative, um, and um, I've kind of had to adapt with all the boosts and everything. But like I always like try to um, upgrade upgrade rookies and just keep keep those keep those nineties ninety five right, and then just trade. But you can be a bit more aggressive and trade Heaney if you want to. Um, update, he's just made my team for the first time this season. <laughs> I must admit, I changed my team a little bit then. <laughs> listening to him, Jay, I was like, actually, no, I'm making that change that I want to change. And that's a great segue into uh, uh, this question from Klopp of Supercoach. Uh, oh, I like fact, Klopp. Well, thank you for the three lovely people. But um, who's a player you really want to pick, but you probably won't? Jeremy <sighs> Cameron. Oh, I tell you what. <laughs> My wife has him in currently in her side, and I don't mind it. Like, I I, I want to see somebody out there with him because he could just come in and dominate early on like he did last year. I yeah, love that. Yeah. That's a great idea. MJ? The heart wants what the heart wants, and every part of me wants to pick Josh Kelly, but I'm not going to do it. No, don't do it. <laughs> Oh, trying. There's one no. player underneath Heaney in that burn book and that burn house, and that yeah, that Josh, is- he's holding it up. I know. Of all the people that <laughs> ten years ago when we started the coaches panel, we we're like, all right, who's the guy that we're going to be on? I'm like, yeah, Josh Kelly, and he goes like one seventeen back to back season super coach. I'm like, this is awesome. He could not have burnt people more over the past eight years. Like, I needed to pick a bomb scorer, Dacos or a Laird, like something good, but. No, yeah. right or I, not, I could, life, Josh. I could ask the community and say well, who's mine and they would pick it straight away, but mine's Jesse Hogan because I so want well, I feel to so me. much better about my burn, man. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. Because And the worry is just because he hyperextended with 90 seconds to go, otherwise he's he was locked in my team because I feel like wow. he's kicking bags the next two weeks. And oh, that's yes. how I was actually originally thinking about going off. Uh, I, I don't mind Hewitt or one of the uh, Brisbane boys, but I was thinking about going Hogan into one of them, but I just don't know if I can do it now that he's has maybe hurt his knee a little bit and potentially when they get 10 goals up, they might go, okay, Jesse, just come off. You've done enough work today. Um, but I feel like one of these games is going like 160. He went 197, second last match last year. So he's got it in him, but I don't think I can go there now with just some of the other options in my team. But I love the question. That's a ripper by Klopp. Uh, we've got uh, fine keys. Who's the better rookie, Seth Campbell or Jack Carroll? Personally, I like I like neither, but you guys might have a different view on that. No, MJ is yeah. definitely unsupportive of that. I, I think no, you, you, there uh, are I, options that are way there better. are better, just better options. I get why you're trying to do it because of the price. Seth Campbell's a small forward in the match sim community series and round zero. He's had nine touches in each. The only difference between his scoring is he's kicked two goals and the tackle count. So if he's not getting on the scoreboard, which small forwards, I, I think it's a worse version of Rochelle, Um, because Rochelle on his day, bang, 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 goes to 100, but gets scoreboard impact. But he's not going to, he's shown he's a nine position game player. And if he's not doing much more, it's just it's not going to happen. Jack Carroll, awesome third quarter. That was amazing how he impacted the game. No, there's a lot of hype about him but it's just sub-risk all over it. They've got Jack Martin, Walsh, Wiedering. Um, I know there's other players coming back from that Blues lineup. They're, they're missing. So even with, so I feel like it's a short term this week um, and then they'll start getting players back after their buy and then you're going to be stuck with this guy who's made you 50K. He'll be on the bubble after their buy in round two. So yeah. give, exactly. give yourself another free hit and if you need to use one of your correctional trades on him after round two, into round three, for me, that would be the case. Give yourself another two weeks of data. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, okay. And talking about rookies, this one's from Jay. Who do you think is going to be the biggest cash cow this season? Oh, I don't uh, know. I, I can see the light, the, like, the, the ticking over in the brain here. And it's a, it's a 
a great question. I'm going to go the easiest option. I'm going to say Alex Sexton. Oh, oh. Uh, Roberts. Roberts. Just yep. He's got it. Or Howes. He's got he's got the high price already in his. <laughs> no. And he's got Bowie. Uh, I've now got Bowie out. It's he's got Bowie out for eight weeks, so he, his job security has just gone through the roof. And if you don't know who Howes is, you need to get him in your team. <laughs> yeah, you need to get him in your <laughs> Thank team. Thank you. Team. <laughs> Definitely. Yes. Um, yes. Because I'm like, who's Seth Campbell? But I'm like, oh, I don't need to worry about him. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Don't worry about him. Uh, uh, no. From Corey, uh, what do we got here from Corey? Oh, yes, LDU, Dawson, or Sarong, pick one. Well, we know MJ, what he's going to say, because he's very big on a, a very uh, a North Melbourne player there. Um, but Emily, what about you? I I would say Dawson. Yeah, he's I'm, not I'm in more my on team. Dawson as well. He's been always in my team. Maybe I should just... Um, He's back in my team as we were talking. I was like, butters, get out. Uh, like, wh- yeah. why did I take Dawson out for five minutes? It's <laughs> just. Uh, Adelaide, um, yeah, because Adelaide, I think, are going to be better this year. Um, and I know there is a lot of, you know, you were like talking about issues with, the, you know, the midfield with, with La- where Laird's going to play. Isn't, wasn't that hilarious, by the way, the, all the media stuff? Have you guys like, yeah. Laird's going to play more forward? I am not playing more forward. <laughs> that is like, well, I'm like, I said the other day he's going to play like an extra five to ten percent forward, so yeah, yeah. he's going to play more forward. That's correct, but it's not as much of a percentage as everyone. Everyone's like, oh, he's going to get dual position. I'm like, he's getting like he'll be like ten fifteen percent at, at best. Yeah. So like, maybe out maybe Order. they smash a couple of teams and he put rest forward those games, and all of a sudden we've got this guy's twenty five percent or something. But he's not getting anywhere between near that dual position. It's just not happening. Nope. So no. that's what he's, anyway, he's Dawson, a group. Yeah, yeah go on. Dawson's the one, the number one. And yeah. I, I, yeah, captain. Um, when did he become captain? Last, oh, year. last year, is his second year at the club. That's how, how much they rated him. Second year yeah, at the yeah. club, yeah, have the captaincy. Yep, yep. So. No, I really rate him. I should probably put him back in my team. I love all those players, by the way. I've had a yep. team where three out of my four players, um, have been those players. I've only got I've got none of them at the moment. Why is that? Um, the, wow. this was a great one for you, MJ, because I know my mate Grimo's been on about this all the time. Ask MJ about this. Cam McKenzie, mate. And could you potentially, if you want now, this is where oh. you may want to have a vanilla team, but the one pod, Cam McKenzie instead of Fife. Yep. You can do yeah. it. Yeah, you can do it. You can absolutely do it. Um do you want to tell I, us the thing I like at McKenzie because I know you've you're very big on him. I have been very big on him. I, I think the reason you'll fade him, then I'll tell you why I think you could pick him. The reason you fade him is, is the ownership of Fife gets into that dangerous phase where it's hard to go against with pedigree and ownership. James Jordan has, while well, he didn't get the CBA bump that I think people had hoped for, he's already advanced one week through his price cycle, and he's probably the one, even more than Ahini, I would be looking at as your pathway to getting into a Sam Flanders after that round four match. To me, that feels like a really easy trade to telegraph of Jordan at five, Flanders in at five, and it could almost be a net neutral kind of trade with a few things going Sydney's way. And then, um, as Ems mentioned, you've got a Sexton, you've got a Reed, you've got a Wilson, you've got a Windsor, you've got a Cadman, uh, you, you've got potentially a Dempsey. You, you, you've got like 15 rookie forward options to consider. And so the only reason you're fading McKenzie is you're like, man, that extra 100K does a whole lot more for me. And, and if someone says that to me, I'll be like, Yep, get it. Won't won't disagree with it. The reason I like McKenzie is I think he's a really beautiful combination of an inside outside player at the Hawks. Got good skills. Does win the contested footy. Does have some speed and some wheels about him. Does apply the defensive pressure as well. And he's a better player in my eyes than a Josh Ward on the inside. Uh, and he's got some greater skills on the outside. And with no Will Day, they need someone to support. Newcomb and Husswade, as lovely as a player he is, he is. He, he's a precision player, slows the game down player. M- McKenzie's got a bit of everything. And so I like McKenzie. But again, if you're playing the percentages, you can go five. If you're playing, I want the extra 100K because it gets me a, a wines up to a butters uh, for, in a player, for example. I, I wouldn't yep. hear it. I'm, I'm not going to tell people you have to pick McKenzie because I can see lots of reasons of why you're going elsewhere. But he's good. Yeah, he's, he's, exactly. worked, 
Yeah, he's 1.9% owned at the moment. Yeah, it's a really yeah. unique yeah. pick. It is really. So you've I got to protect the, it with other picks. Yeah. Yeah. I love the I love him because I I'm in about five keeper leagues and I've I think I've got him in every one. So I'll be following his career very closely. He's your new boy after yes, Jesse he Hogan. You're on the mate. Yes, my boy Jesse Hogan. Uh, okay. Um, oh, it's actually a good one for uh, in regards to scores last week and because of their draw. Any love for Lockie Ash out there? Like I'm, I was more talk like a lot of talk about Whitfield and talk about the ultimate burn man. Um, if Heaney is, a, I think it is Whitfield for a lot of people. Uh, but there has been a little bit of talk in the community because Ash went 130. You know, they've got a couple of injuries down half back. And if you were looking at one of these flip players because he's already got that in his score, could you see people starting Ash? I'll go MJ on that. I could see it, but I think there's a player I like more, and I'm just double-checking his price before I tell you if he's a better pick for him or not. Uh, um, I'll go. I'll, I'll probably you why I can do it. I can do it I'll now. Go. I figured out. Yeah. Harry Himmelberg's like twenty thousand cheaper. Mm. Yeah. And yeah. if you're looking at a giant sky that, and again, he had a good score for us last week. You're looking and you're trying to play the matchups. Oh boy, like Himmelberg could feast, and he's cheaper, and he's he's also the kind of player that if you're looking to flip him at round three, you're going to be less married to that than Ash. Because he does feel like the kind of go, who oh, he might just get me a 95. He might just get me a hundred. Whereas Himmelberg, you can feel a little bit more disciplined. So out of the two, I'd probably take Himmelberg. Yeah. It's no, a really awkward him. price. He's he a really is. awkward price. I know, I know some of the super coach, um, Dr. Super Coach guys got on him last year. Um, and he kind of burnt people. Um, so I know, and it's like now he has the role they thought that he might <laughs> have had last year. Always um, happens a year after. Yeah. Just, yeah. If you really like it, don't let us talk. Go yeah. for him. If you love go him, go for him. Back your gut. Uh, okay. To Global, Holty, a few other people have been asking about this. Cherry to start Cherry and can you get him to English? I think you need to rewind this pod when we uh, we talked about this. But I think, yeah, Cherry's definitely somebody as a cash cow to start off with because – what English averaged like 128 last year, and he's a brilliant player. Um, there is some talk that Lob might get a little bit more time. I don't think it's going to be drastic uh, just the way they set up, but even if it's 5%, 10%, I feel like English could come down to 120 guy this year, or if even he gets an injury or concussion or something like that will happen. I, I just can't see him going back-to-back 128s. That's a ridiculous score for a Ruckman, even like you know Sandy and Cox weren't doing that. Um, back in their day. So I feel like he could come back to, say, a 120. Cherry, Cherry's got 100 in him. And like, at the moment, the gap between it's 60, about 60 points. Um, so they could close to get to about a 20-point difference, which you're talking about then. It's like 100K territory um, by the time you'd want to upgrade them. And I'm feeling like, yeah, compared to now where they're 315K together. So, yeah, I, th- I think that's that's fine, especially... Also, what are you going to do with that 315K? For me, I can go Fife up to, say, Jackson as that backup, go go that sort of small play, which I'm, I think most of the community know I'm not the world's biggest fan on Fife. But, yeah, you can do things like that. Like 315 is a massive upgrade in your team. Um, so, yeah, that that's my view on it, and I, I'm pretty sure um, the other two have probably a similar view. Yeah, I think if, if you want to look at fixture, North Melbourne, have got a pretty nice early fixture too in terms of who they're rucking against. West Coast, it's Bailey Williams and potentially Callum Jamison. It's Fremantle, so it's a Luke Jackson. It's Hawthorne, who historically are a good matchup for our rucks. And then it's Carlton and it's a Tom DeConning, who again are a reasonable matchup for our rucks. So that first four weeks where we're going to get that price movement is there in terms of who he's going to be up against. So to me... Like if there was one player I'd be really trying to tell people to go that opens up everything for your side structurally, it's Cherry. Um, of anyone in that 400K price range, who's got the best job security, who's got the safest role, who's got the pedigree of a narrow couple of games I know, and who's got the fixture, Cherry, 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 Cherry. I'm talking <laughs> myself into captaining him at this point. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm <laughs> not really? good. Um, yeah, look. I get it. I really get it. I'm not playing with that. I'm not putting him in my team. Um, I don't Come have Dawson, by the way. Join the dark side. <laughs> oh, oh. Join us, one of um, us. 
Yeah, yeah. Look, I understand. <laughs> I understand that cash can go away. I've already done um, some cheeky things to get some more cash, uh, which we can talk a bit about later. I don't know if you might approve of my little cheeky things that I've done. Oh, now now um, that you've put it out there, you've got to share this. You've yeah, won it. The answer I'll is be... yes. You're right. Um, chair, but look, oh, I'm so frustrated that he just didn't get a good go at it. Like when he was cheap, uh, like I presume, I presume if he was, I mean, I know, it's, I mean, everyone would have him if it was in the 200s. But you know, I just really wish that threshold of his scoring was a little less, um, and there was a little less risk. But still, I look, I really like the idea of the Jackson and Cherry. Like you've got that backup. I don't know if I would loop him, but I would have him and at least I could, you know, make things work. Um, but, again, if you've got the structure, if it makes your team sing, then then go for it. So my little um, – and this is not a secret because Chris has been doing this <laughs> um, since the start of preseason, which I obviously didn't – that's not where I got this idea from, um, but is Nick Dacos in my midfield. And I got Tom Stewart as D one, so I I did have did have four. So now I currently so now Dacos is is M one, um, and uh, yeah. Now then I do have Dawson Butters and Green, um, which we can talk about. I don't know if anyone wants to talk about the Green the Green Machine, um, but then I've got Stewart as D. And apparently Stewart's kind of he's he's the one that's kind of been kind of been traded out. I think. Um, but look, I, I'm not trading out Stuart. Even though with the 18, right, like he's my boy. So he's my D1. So that's how I've saved still having four premiums in my mids. Um, and I have two rookie defenders on um on field. So I have I, you know, I'm living dangerously and I've got Gib Kirsten Howes as D5 and D6. I won super coach with literally like three quarters of a defender on my D, like, <laughs> like patched up tape of it. Like I had, yeah, I was wow. this close of a donut um, for the first couple of rounds, and it was just wow. this player that just came out of nowhere who was scoring seventies, who just slid into my D six. Forget, I should remember his name. <sighs> but so yeah, that but sounds like me last year. Em. Relying on guys getting subbed in early just so I could get a, get a but, score, and then they come yeah. out and save my day. But however, I've I've got I've got I've thought this through, right? So DPP should happen round six, right? Round one, round four is the only time that I have to field a full team that's not mm -hmm. best 18. Round six, I have Dacos, hopefully Martin, um uh, uh, HH. I'm not HH, I'm Roberts. Um who's gonna it's actually, uh, I'm going to pause you there because it's yeah. actually after round six this year. Yeah, oh, so they've no, moved it back really? a week. They've moved it Just back because of the round. opening round. Because oh, okay. I was, that that actually changed some of my plans because they're like, okay. no, we're going to let every team have a buy first. So. <laughs> That's okay because round six is a buy anyway. There's a buy yeah, round correct. six, yeah? Yeah, you're fine. So you're right. Your principle's still right in. Two yeah, teams. Yeah. So that, in look, two weeks, you've got to do 22. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my that's how I've saved cash. Um, we're still having four mid mid premiums still. Um, um, but look, you might you might hate it, but that's how I have saved. And I've got Gorn Grundy, and I've got my forward line is currently Jackson Heaney <laughs> and Fisher. Um, catching some fish with Fisher, who um, he, he might also get um, DPP as well. So yeah, so that's my plan. No, I like nice. it, like it a lot. Um, I do like this one. Actually, a couple of people have asked about this because I've been looking at him. Is uh, George Hewitt uh, currently in two percent of teams? Um, so it's been brought up by a few people in the chat. I have played around with him. I just like the idea, the fact that I want to watch another week from him. He's the sort of guy, and that's where I was really big on starting Hogan originally because it worked perfectly. Hogan into um, into Hewitt. Uh, just because, yeah, we get uh, he should probably get an easy kill against Richmond this week as a part of me going, okay, you'll have the buy round the following week, um, which, yeah, I, I think it probably offsets what he probably ever gets. But, yeah, if, if we get a free look at him and he goes 120, then, yeah, that's something that we've got to seriously consider. 
Yeah, it's okay. another awkward price, isn't he? But um, Four, again, say you can correct him to him. Um, he doesn't change his price in round three. three. No need to get him before his buy. Um, yeah, um, but where are you going to squeeze him in? But sure. <laughs> I, I think you're right there, Em. We get injuries. So that's more, I would rather see what happened. Hopefully touch wood does not happen, but, it, you know, it's part of the game. It's footy. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I think I more would like to see what happens and then make the call there. Um, yeah, it's a free, so I wouldn't be starting him, but, yeah, just one to monitor this week and then we'll, we'll go from there. It's the same with uh, JP's guy, Harry Mackay, who he's been spooking him all preseason, had an awesome first game up. Now, if he comes out, which I expect him to do as well tomorrow night while I'm sitting there at the G and in the probably the cold, the wet, and watching my boys get pumped by Carlton, that'll be fun. Um, but yeah, if Harry Mackay comes out and goes 120, 130 again at under 400K, but well, somebody then we've, we've got to review after their buy for sure. So, and they do have North Melbourne and Fremantle straight after their buy too. So they do have a good run continuing. Yeah, okay, you missed out on these points, but nothing worse than going early on them. And then for whatever reason, they get injured, they put up a 40, and then you're stuck with this player making no cash down. Like, you'd rather some certain – You'd a good thing about the Blues is they play North straight afterwards. So whatever they're probably going to do to Richmond, they're going to do the, probably the same to North. That's no disrespect to our North Melbourne friends. Don't start getting in that group chat. Um, but it's just – that's reality. So, yeah, I, I think you can wait on that one. Curdy, uh, I'll get to your question because it is a good one. Uh, crazy fo frogs, love you, crazy frogs. We're saying a lot of good stuff in the chat. Um, Butters captain this week, or do you have a? What are your recommendations for vice captain captain this week? We'll start with you, Em. Hi, crazy. <laughs> um, uh, yes, uh, Butters captain this week. Oh, I don't know. I now have a loophole which I'm really excited about, and I didn't have a loophole because I've had Nate Smith for so long. Um, so I'm really excited. I can actually BC. Um, I maybe <laughs> I haven't even looked at it. <laughs> um, I don't like Captain Butters. I like VC Butters um, personally because of his injury history. So a bit the crazy. Is, there's, not, there's not a yeah. lot of footy being played after Butters this week. That's the, no, uh, you're you're yeah, stuck no, at Frio no, and lines. Yeah. No, no, I, I, uh, I said it without looking at the fixture, but I'm just saying, I'm just saying what I honestly, I don't like yeah, captains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe hmm. there, there's a chance like because we were talking before about his ankle injuries. Like, if it goes to plan and they pump West Coast, what's hmm. to stop them at three quarter time going? Okay, come off Zach. You, you, you're not having any Nothing. more of a. Uh, yeah, you've done your job for the day, and that's my worry about not just the selection of butters, let alone the captaincy of butters. Um, what are your thoughts, MJ, on captaincy this week? I think if you're a Nick Dacos owner, he's your vice captaincy option on that Friday night matchup against the Swans. So that would be one of the appeals of why you're picking him with. They've got the first three weeks, a two Thursdays and one Friday night matchup. So that's one of the reasons you do love a Nick Dacos and you're trying to take on the potential tag of round four, the potential that he's not quote-unquote value in what is offered price point. He'd be there. Bontempelli's probably your safety net with that first game on a Sunday afternoon against Melbourne. Viney will certainly try to play a level of, of strength at the contest against him, but my goodness me, how much have we talked about? What was it, just one score under 100 last year in Supercoach? If you want a safety net, that again is the reason you pick him. So a day cost bond for the first three weeks, both on fixture and on in the timing of the fixture, to me feels really safe. And then you can use your butters, your greens, um, your Stewarts. I like the matchup, although, you know, potentially there might be an accountable forward going on at Tom Stewart this week. Uh, uh, these are the sort of players that you try to get them early in the week with the ceiling, and then you bank it with some protection there. So uh, Dacus into Bont if you just want to play a straight back with your captaincy this week. Yeah, I've got uh, close. I've got Tom Green into Bont just because yep, perfect Green's playing North Melbourne. Uh, I feel perfect like I need fine. something in that game. But then watch Dacos. Dacos is going 140 and just dominating. Uh, I don't have Bond. I, oh, you don't, don't have Bond? I love it. And I'm Captain Gorn. Is that a ramp shot? What kind of shot is that? Is that a... Oh, that, that's everything. That's a reverse sweep. <laughs> Over the keeper's head. Suddenly I like that. it. 
Uh, Kurti, I know yeah, a couple of people have asked about this. Um, so I apologize uh, as we're working through the questions there. But Jared Lyons, um, for me, I think it's the exact same conversation we just had with the Blues. I want to see it one more time. Um, I feel like he's still potentially that sub risk, but just, I'm more worried. I thought it was it's a horses of courses for matchups. Um, maybe out on the big off the stadium, they probably might go for a little bit more outside speed. The game's played differently compared to what the gapper is, but you know he could very much be part of that midfield and score well. Uh, MJ, I, I totally agree. I like Lions as a pick, but. Don't back yourself into a corner that you don't need. You're going to make at least one correctional trade this year. I guarantee you the law of averages, something is going to happen, either injury, um, you uh, you miss a guy, something happens that you need to correct. Lions can be your correctional guy that you get after that round two by. And so whether a cow's not delivering the way you like, using a hus weight. Not, I, I'm not picking on Henry. I'm just trying to keep some continuity. Um, is He doesn't do what you want over the first two weeks and he's on the bubble in round three. Make the flip and go there. So to me, yeah, he's he's a post-round two option. And, and I think he stays regardless. With no Ashcroft, he, he was one of the guys that did come into that side and does look good. It gives them diversity with how they want to use a humic luggage. Um, it means they can play some accountable footier with Dunkley if they need to use that all those kind of options. So, yeah, post-buy for me. Exactly. Uh, thoughts on Dempsey or McNeil on the, as your forward bench? Emily, you'd know a bit more about that Dempsey. I think I was actually there for his debut, which was pretty cool down in Tasmania. But what are your thoughts on uh, Ollie there? Um, I really like him and he actually um, – I'm on Jazz's channel and he had a shoot, shoot uh, a shoot-off kick, like kicking thing with, with Dempsey and he actually won against Cameron um I've done I've we've done a, a top like a best 22 with Geelong um and this is where the whole we're not Mark Chris Scott mind readers um Rowan have being out does does live give a position but where is O'Connell where is Tui so um I've got them kind of sharing a spot um together um, and then there's Dempsey, and then there is um, Shannon. Neil. Neil. Neil, thank you. <laughs> um, so I think where they're looking for to build a Hawkins replacement, they're not silly, they're not stupid. They know they need to put legs into these tall men. Uh, which one they like, I don't know. Will they switch? Absolutely. Rotating door, sub, absolutely. Alarm bells. I would trade him in. I, I would wait until he's named on this round, on his third game. But, um, I, I, I love the kid. I would love him to give it a go. Look, Chris Scott is so funny. Like, he, if he likes a rookie, if he likes someone, he will pick them round one and he will play them. But we he, they might not necessarily be the person that we want or expect. So he can do it. But I just feel like if you start playing with the the best 22, best 23, it starts to get really, really squishy. Um, like, and I, I, yeah, if we talk, I can actually talk to you a little bit who I actually have um, in that kind of grey area if you want to talk about something else. <laughs> yeah, I was going to, I was going to move on and, uh, that's really also about these forward rookies. Um, with Thorthorpe out, um, can you pick Burgess or is it somebody just to watch? Uh, so, I, and I think there's a, there is a spot for a lot of people with this F8 position, or if depending on where you've got Cadman at F7, F8, if you're looking at him. Uh, but yeah, I, I know Bicky, who's crossed over from Richmond to North, um, Buku Karmas could potentially be playing back down there too. So, there seems to be a lot of options of that sort of 123 to 140 mark. Kyle Lohman's been thrown up. You know, they've got a whole lot of players there that I think it's up for, up in the air for a lot of people. Um, so what are, what are your thoughts there, MJ? He's in the mix for you, isn't he? He's going to get that spot with no Phil Thorpe. He was the replacement. That's why they got him from Gold Coast. With Chris, you get a guy that can play key position defender, can play key position forward, kicked a bag of goals the past two years in the VFL, and can play ruck. And so you get this beautiful three-in-one cover utility of key position assets. Unfortunately for everyone other than Chris, 
he's going to walk straight into this side. Um, and that's a good news for us in the fantasy community. I don't think it'll be enough to pick up DPP. Phil Thorpe was never enough to get it. So don't have that expectation that Burgess is going to be there. But I think a, a 50 average and get eight weeks of games. And if you can jag a couple of bags of three, that's a bag for Chris um, at, at AFL level. Yeah, you might pop a 70 here or there. So he's in the mix. He wouldn't be ahead of Cadman. For me, I've got Cadman ahead because he's already in that price cycle movement and Chris is a week behind. But, yeah, if you want a guy that could jag you a 70 or an 80 on his day and shouldn't go much under a 50, yeah, Chris is in the mix. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, Darcy Cameron, you know, potential dual position, no, that's not happening. If anybody's a wow Mason Cox by the other day, might be lucky to be in the side come next week. Uh, so now he's playing full ruck. It's funny there's not as much talk about Darcy Cameron this year compared to last year. There's a lot yeah. of talk about him. And he started on a house on fire and then just got injured. But maybe it's just because Cherry's the guy in this year at that cheaper price. Um, but I, like Cameron could potentially average 100. Like all those rucks are in the same. Anyone that plays sole ruck. You know, I think the worst last year was maybe Riley O or maybe Lewenberger. Oh, no, um, yeah, the big O, um, Matt McInerney who might have been 95, but even he still missed some games. And I think there was an injury affected couple of games in there. So he probably would have got close to the 100 mark as well. If you're a sole ruck, you're pretty well going 100. Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, I, if Mason's out, may, not DPP, but then consider Cameron. Yeah, exactly. But I, I wouldn't Hi, be like that. So Chris has jumped on. The Dr. Supercoach boys, lovely to have you guys on there. I so I have no idea why. I don't think Em chucked you under the bus. Maybe she did. That's great. Uh, so awesome. Never. <laughs> Never. Uh, that, FPL. that was the other M. <laughs> yeah, that's the other M. Um, thoughts on Goldstein and if a new ruck rule benefits or uh, – yeah, what are your thoughts on the new ruck rule there, MJ? Because we sort of started to see it last week. We saw it a bit in the preseason. Um, so what are your thoughts around that, mate? I think physical ruckmen are going to get a benefit from it. So guys like a Briggs, guys like a Gorn are going to benefit because it's no longer just the athleticism and leap that is rewarded. It is now around the grounds. If you can position your body well and use that component to the game, you can dominate, which is why, you know, Em, you're talking about going to a Gorn this year. I have no problems with anybody locking into Gorn this year because, what, 10 days ago? We were all frothing over him after he destroyed Tom DeConning and Mark Pittenett, and then we see one bad half, and we're off him. He, the only one, is just as likely to go 150-150 and be net neutral with his scoring through there. So I think Goldstein could be a benefit for it, but outside of drafts, I want no interest in him. Uh, the reality is, is there's so many other better options that I think have stronger ceiling, that have better midfields around him, so it helps with that hit out still advantage component as well, which we know is super critical for us in Supercoach. So, yeah, I, I'm looking at other options well ahead of Todd Goldstein this year outside of drafts. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of love here for uh, Tommy Stewart on there, so I'm not going to click on all of them. Um, Cats, we've talked about Cherry to death. Uh, yeah, really? Let's, let's go around again. We can let's go, go around again. We can go around that planet again. Um, yeah, this is actually a good one for the defense because most of us have locked in day cost at day one. I, uh, you know, there's a couple of people saying we're going to the antipod, but um, I think the majority of the community is there. D2 and D3 gets really interesting. A lot of people still have sort of young at D3 or D4, depending on how deep you're going. But then names like at the moment I've got Houston and Short, a lot of people have Sheasel. Or then they're kind of looking at maybe that pod, pod person, maybe at that D3 position. Uh, so what are what are you guys been looking at there? Because I like Short's role. I think it's great. We know he hasn't ever averaged over 100, but um, I don't think Richmond have been in such a poor position like this maybe in his time. Um, so I think there's potential for him there. And it's a good debate between sort of him, Sheasel and Houston and even, I guess, the left field Ryan, who's just going to rack up as free or play boring football as they always do. MJ? Yeah, you could probably throw a Stewart into the mix of that and Whitfield. Uh, yeah, Stewart as well. I forgot so, to mention that. Um, 
so yeah, shorts in the mix for you. And, and again, he's got a better buy than some of the guys that played from opening round. So you actually get to watch and see it a little bit more, like the price movement, you get a couple of elements. So yeah, if someone's big on short, I wouldn't talk you out of it at all. I, I actually don't see a world where he doesn't average 100 this year. And that's not just because of where the ball is, but just purely he's always been an injury or a role change that under Damien Hardwick kind of happened. If he's fit, He's a hundred guy to me, and so could very happily start short, and I wouldn't talk anyone out of it. And people also talking about defence on there. Like I've had a few people talking about Christian Salem in the chat, um, which we were talking before about, and we we're saying maybe some people going too much of a pod, but I always don't mind the idea of one or two if that's you know you don't want to go like complete vanilla but at the same time um you don't want to go to you know out there with your teams crazy frogs already replying to that um, idea but um yeah so Chris, christian salem is a potential pot at d4 which i don't mind i think if you start getting a bit like the person before say martin at d2 you become a bit too weak and too risky there but at d4 potentially you're, you're taking on a um a hayden young for example 38% CBAs versus one shifting to half back 102 and 93 in his two outings this season so far. Thoughts about that as a maybe a cheaper option that nobody's actually talking about, apart from people in our group chat, which is awesome. Oh, we've got a lip read. Oh, Emily's Hi, gone. Emily's gone. There we go. There she is. So I'm muted oh. because of my kids keep coming and checking on me. Um, oh. Yeah, no, Salem, look. I don't, I don't mind. Uh, yeah, I don't mind it. Like, who's taking, who's taking Brayshaw? Oh, that's just so sad. My heart breaks. Who's is, you know, Brayshaw's spot and role? Um, does he have the role? Is this, you know, I've always loved Salem, um, but yeah, look, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Like, if you want to go, it just depends on your risk profile. Yeah, that, I think that's it. Um, I better put mention this guy because he's one of the best. Uh, blokes and cricketers that I know. Uh, Nico, what um, mid-price forward would you recommend? Oh, it's Mackenzie, Jordan, Fife. Like, these are all guys in there. Fisher's Fisher. in the mix for you in that. Um, and I don't think you need much more than that because then yeah, you're probably taking a slice of one of those top-end forwards, whether it be a Heaney, Jackson, a Flanders, um, and then you get your, your spattering of cash cows. You, you just don't need too many bites of the cherry there. And if you are taking a ton of value loops in that midfield line or in that defensive line, you've got to protect some of these picks knowing that you're going to need these parachutes to get pulled at the end of round two, at the end of round three. So, yeah, I think you only need one or two of them, Nick, Nico. And, yeah, I think you know which ones are. Yeah. yeah. I just um, read which big price forward and i'm like jerry Rick. no no it's mid price no <laughs> well it's kind of mid price it's just premium mid price <laughs> that's good all right we might we might finish it off with this last question so i think this is good from from greeny uh do you think players with higher ceilings are more important because of the extra best 18 rounds this year m um that's a really really good question like um so yeah, no, I, I was kind of left field. I, I I honestly think people are. I, I kind of pro, posed this in um, on Slack earlier today whether we're overthinking the buys a bit, and then um, then everyone was like, "Well, it's maths. We're just using maths, and like we're you know if someone's not playing around, you know, uh, uh, then it makes sense that. But you know, for example, I think Tom Green, like he needs to average so much, possibly like 130. Um, to actually make it worthwhile. but And like what I was saying about choosing those rookies, so it's an interesting thing about high ceiling, like those high spiked players, <laughs> Jeremy Cameron. Um, but like it's an interesting idea. Like um, do it. Try to win a grand, two grand. Like I don't know if you can win. You can have a whole lot of fun, so much more fun if you just choose those high-end players. Wow, we could feel a team. With the high ceiling players, um, I think it's a great idea. I think if you want, if you are competitive, you've got cash leads, you don't want to go too crazy. Choose one, choose your most favourite one, and then you can always trade out of them. Or better, trade in. You know, wait until round three. Lots of people do it. Ted Walker, Tex Walker, mm -hmm. um, 
I didn't jump on, but I know a lot who did. Um, and he was a really great cash cow. So um, maybe just wait for a bit of the cash cow and who's who's kind of got that momentum and jump on them um, because, you know, especially if they're a high quality player, they usually go on trends. It's no, you know, um, they can do about, you know, five, six weeks of those really high scores. That would Tom, be my Tom recommendation. Tom Lynch is a great example of that a couple of years ago as well. Yeah. 160, 180. Just they, these key, the key forwards are the big ones. Key forwards get going and they get on a roll for a, a yeah. purple patch for a month. Uh, cut Charlie Kern out last year. You know, I was banging, yeah. you know, bags of goals for fun at one stage. So, yeah, if you see a key forward with a good uh, run coming up, like we said before, the Blues right now playing Richmond into North Melbourne Fremantle, like, doesn't get too much easier than that. There are going to be periods of time this year where teams are going to have defenders missing and they're going to have West Coast and Richmond in that or, uh, you know, Hawthorne, North Melbourne. Um, and you, you can sort of go with that with the extra trade. Maybe that's why you keep a couple up your sleeve because Jeremy Cameron or Charlie Kernow at some point are going to go, you know, Wooshka and be banging out 140s for fun. And you kind of might want to get on that four or five week period. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's a different strategy, but it's definitely worked with people in the past with lesser trades. So I think you've definitely got to think about that. Um, and yeah. thank you to this one, Global A Team League in the house. MJ has joined our A Team League. I think we just missed the, the number one overall league last year. Um, oh, so well, only way is down pretty, then, isn't it? Yeah, it's pre pretty competitive, our league, MJ. So uh, oh, no pressure coming that. into that, mate. Oh, uh, but goodness me. But thank you, firstly, to everybody that's tuned in tonight. Really do appreciate it. Um, to the people who have been asking about, oh, can we rate your teams and stuff like that, I'll try my best to either put up a team pod or at least answer your questions on Twitter at some point um, because it's just too, too hard to put up teams here and go through. And the most of it I'm finding, a lot of people have probably between 24 and 26 players the exact same and, and there's like four differences. Uh, so, yeah, I'm finding that this year more than probably ever. Um, so I will try my best to answer with, with that. But if not just me, hit up some of the other good content creators. In particular, go check out the coaches panel if you have not already. Do marvellous work. Uh, but M, we'll start with you. Thank you so much for coming on. The absolute treasure, a part of the Super Coach community. So thank you for joining us tonight. No, it's been fun. And MJ, it's awesome to have, finally sit down with you on a podcast and just chat footy, mate. Oh, mate, it's just... Always been a big fan of what you've been doing. You, you and Em have both been staples of the Super Coach community for a long time. So, um, yeah, the fact that you invite me in and, and let me be a part of not only the league but a part of your content uh, team and, and jumping on this stream is a, a privilege, mate. So, thank you. Beautiful, thank you. All right, Super Coach community, we'll be back soon. Take care. Bye. Bye.